It can't be mindful of sleep, but it doesn't mean going to sleep and waking up, it means being asleep. We know what the purpose of that is. And so the only way that that can make sense is if you are mindful uh, of the purpose of sleep afterwards. Sometimes the use of the past and present is quite loose in private. They have something called like historic present. Now there I am, just uh, having lunch today. I'm not having lunch. I have lunch, but we have this historic present remembering something and putting it into the present moment. So um, these were <laughs> well, got one page of that done. When I come to that tomorrow, I'm, on the next day, I will emphasize that and point it out to her. But it is, these are restraining the five hindrances. That's why we have uh, the sense restraint. We have the, as part of the higher practice of virtue, in order that we can actually see things more clearly. The five hindrances are stated to be both that thing which weakens wisdom, which hinders stillness. So hopefully, that's an important point, and thank you for paying attention, but it does mean those five hindrances aren't totally eradicated, but they're weakened enormously, enough, so that you can practice mindfulness and not be, have your uh, wisdom distorted. What is the Buddhist view on death in the following circumstances? Assisted suicide, as in Switzerland, keeping people alive when they are and have been for some time unable to swallow food or drink by using tube feeding and treating a pneumonia with an antibiotic in an elderly person with end-stage dementia. Uh, you've probably heard me say in other talks that the purpose of a carer, a doctor, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, whatever, anyone in those type of professions is not to cure but to care. And if we take curing, keeping people alive as the main purpose, we go into some very, very intrusive and uncomfortable sort of end-of-life situations. Uh, I got this from a, a Tibetan nun and I did this uh, little exercise myself when I was in Hong Kong. I had like a workshop situation and I divided the people who were mostly like nurses, counselors, a couple of doctors as well, into two groups. And I just pair off A and B. And then the exercise was that when I ran the gun, those who I assigned A to would act out as best they possibly could, having a heart attack, make it erratic, fall into the floor. And you know, when I was just talking to each other, and I ran the gun, it wasn't very important. And then, oh, oh, and they fall onto the floor because they were in that profession. They'd seen people having heart attacks before, so they knew what they were acting out. And the other one was supposed to be the first responder. And so it went something like some people were really knew what to do, others were sort of saying, Keep looking at me, keep your eyes open, be with me, keep with me, help is coming, it's going to be okay. And then we had feedback afterwards, it was only play acting. For the person who was enduring the heart attack, playing, role playing, how did it feel? And he said it was so intrusive, it was so uh, unacceptable. Dying is a very private moment. And all these people trying to keep you alive at all costs, when you just want some space to die, and that was no, only a sort of summary. Then we reversed the roles. And then when I ran the bell, 
and the other person began to have a heart attack, then the first responder was more of saying, oh, it's okay, just let go, <laughs> be peaceful, remember your good karma. Keeping them alive is not a priority anymore. It's letting them find some peace, some stillness, some happiness, some joy. However that was, that became more important. And what it did, it did, this was uh, for, you know, we are in a hospital in Hong Kong. What they did, it just emphasizes that we have a priority now in our culture, keeping people alive at all costs, being afraid of death. Because one of those reasons is because we think this is the only life we have. And so we've got to make it as well as possible when we've got one chance. But you've got another life afterwards, another life, another life. No, it's not so important. As one of the great uh, philosophers from Liverpool used to say, this was not um, uh, John Lennon, this was Bill Shankly, who was the manager of the Liverpool Football Club who when asked why is it that some people think that football, soccer, is a matter of life and death, and he said, no, they're wrong. Soccer is not a matter of life and death, it's much more important than that. <laughs> yes, and many people, if they follow soccer and sport, sometimes that's how they behave. Much more important than life and death. But, because we are trying to keep people alive at all costs, no problem, so. Now, with what we're talking about, assisted suicide, it's better described as euthanasia or voluntary euthanasia. Euthanasia is where you, know, you take people's decisions away from them and you euthanize them, basically to put them out of your misery, not of their misery. And you can understand why, to see someone you love suffering so much, to see them just, just uh, such a shadow of their former selves, no quality of life, not really being able to know what's going on. And sure the one who is suffering seeing them like that. So many times it's putting them out of your own suffering. But voluntary is an atheist, and basically that's not your right, you know, to kill somebody else. And that's why we have those precepts in Buddhism. But more interesting is voluntary euthanasia, where the person makes their own decision to actually to commit suicide. And they make a, a rational decision when they're still able to make that decision. Most importantly, they have control of their senses, and they are not under any coercion you know, from family or from others. And as best you possibly can, and there's always, you know, some, um, some problems, but you go through a couple of psychiatrists or something, doc first of all, a couple of doctors to make sure that, you know, the illness is terminal. There's no real reasonable possibility of um, reversal of that, uh, decline into death. And also that you are in full control of your faculties. You're not depressed. You're not sort of angry. You're not making a statement. You are as clear as possibly can be. And you make that decision. And what happens is the person makes that, they've checked so many times, and we had uh, one of the, the founders of Exit International come to a Buddhist conference in Perth some years ago because I wanted to find out exactly what it is. Before you make a decision, you know what you're deciding about. Now, because the first person in modern times who took voluntary euthanasia legally was a Mr. Dent in the Northern Territory who was a Buddhist. 
because he was a Buddhist. I never met him, but one of my monks did, who asked him, why are you doing that? And the reason why he was doing that was what he said was to free his wife. His wife was giving him 24-7 care. She did get respite every now and again when she got exhausted. But nevertheless, she was of the understanding that no one else could convince her it was her duty to look after the love of her life to the very end. He said he could endure the pain and discomfort of the last you know, years of his life, but he couldn't stand seeing her sacrifice everything for him. He wanted to free her so she could have a life. And that was the purpose, the reason why he took part to euthanasia. And a drip was put into his arm, and he was on a computer screen, and there were many, 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 many hurdles he had to cross. It wasn't just a casual decision, yes or no, and then the, um, I think it was usually Ben Buton, was, in, uh, was uh, entered into the, the trip, into the stream, and then he would die really, very peacefully, apparently. But he had many times, he had to, do you know what's going to happen if you continue on? If you press this to continue, press this to stop. Many, 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 many hurdles to make absolutely sure he knew what he was doing, what the consequence was. So, do I agree with that or not? It's not my business. It's your business. You are the owners of your karma, as they say in Buddhism. We take responsibility for our actions. And it's not up to me to say yes or no. But, I certainly <coughs> cannot criticize it. In cases where, uh, especially with dementia, severe dementia. When I went to visit my mother, who's passed away, in a uh, closed ward in St. Albans. My mother was always a positive woman, so she was quite peaceful with her dementia. But I sat next to two women who were continually terrified because they were waking up every couple of seconds and have no memory of where they were, who they were, who was with them. And I could just about get some idea of how they felt because I do travel around a lot in hotels and in teaching, in monasteries, in retreats centers like this. And have you ever the first time you wake up in the morning where the hell am I? What is this? Who am I with? And I've had that feeling when you first wake up. It takes you a whole year I'm in the retreat centre. But imagine that happening every two or three seconds, 24 hours of your life, forever. They were in constant terror because they had no reference point, which we have from our past. No way of knowing where they were, who they were, what they're supposed to be doing. And it's so easy to see, you can't miss it, the terror in their faces. Not a physical pain, but the emotional suffering. So cases like that, you know, all the time when people make um, surveys, Usually 70, 80 percent of people say we want the option of voluntary euthanasia. It was stopped in Northern Territories because there was a couple of very staunch Christian <coughs> politicians who stopped it. But now it's been permitted in Victoria, in Australia, and Western Australia, the state where I live, they're going to be voting on that next year, and everyone knows it's going to pass. I don't think voluntary euthanasia is permitted yet in the um, UK. Is that the case? Yeah. 
So it's going to happen. What do you think? When it comes to Buddhism and your precepts, if you look very carefully, and I had this argument with Venerable Dhamma Vihari, who was a very interesting man. He was a scholar of Pali, and then he became a monk. And because uh, he was uh, English speaking, he had wonderful arguments. One of those arguments, you can have an argument with a monk. Just because you're a monk, it doesn't mean you're right. <laughs> so you, you, you chat to each other, right? And that's what you like. And in the end, I convinced him that the first precept, Paramati Paramati is destroying the life of another. <coughs> Suicide is on <coughs> And it's fascinating why the Buddha would do that. And anyway, just to throw out a curly one for you. Did the Buddha commit suicide? Our Buddha. He said, he can't do that. No, he can't commit suicide. According to the story that he ate a pork curry at the very end of his life, surely he would have known with his powers, that that was going to kill him. He did that uh, willingly. And anyway, three months before he passed away, he told people, I'm going to die in three months. He willingly let go of his life. Isn't that the definition of suicide? Willingly creating the situation and causes where your life ends. Ananda, his close attendant, he was being chased by two, two kings or leaders of areas because they both wanted his ashes. Ashes and relics are big business. If you don't believe me, just if you have time, go look at the cathedral in Norwich. This is the cathedral of the one of the reasons why Norwich became a big city. I think well, I've killed his name, it's St. Julian of Norwich or something. But anyway, there was this little priest from Norwich, who had this small little country town. He went on pilgrims about <coughs> six or seven centuries ago into Europe where one of these saints uh, in a cathedral they would display his body in an open casket once a year so that the pilgrims could kiss his deceased body <laughs> for good luck, either with diseases, illnesses, or business, or whatever. So it was a gross thing to do. I'm not sure if I would ever just kiss a body which had been dead for 50 years. <laughs> but that's what. Uh, people were doing good luck. And so this priest from Norwich, he travelled all the way to some place in Europe, not to get there. But he did much more than kiss. He bit off this saint's nose. <laughs> Kept it in his mouth, because that's the only way he could smuggle it through the equivalent of customs. <laughs> and he brought it all the way back here to Norwich. So that Norwich had a part of this saint's body, his nose. <laughs> and they put it on display and so many poor boots came from all over England and many other places, which meant they needed hotels, food, looking after their horses, and that was the start of Norwich becoming economically viable. <laughs> if you have time, check that out in the Cathedral up in Norwich. So, Ananda is similar, that people love relics. I don't know it's stupid, but for those of you who wonder about Buddhism, the Buddha said, Be an heir to my, don't be an heir to my material things, be an heir to my Dharma, my teachings. So, the relics of the Buddha 
Is it sufficient if we get upset related to the Buddha are his teachings? Not bones. <coughs> but anyway, even Ananda, he was you know, getting old, about to die, and two people wanted his relics. Two countries, principalities in India. So he got to the boundary river between the two principalities. And then he used his psychic powers, rose up into the air, immolated himself, and then two exactly equal parts of ashes fell on either side of the river, so those two countries wouldn't go to war. Interesting. If any of you know ancient Greek, please have a look. Somewhere in, um, I forget which text it was now, Greek text, in Athens, in the Forum, in Athens, there was a Indian person called Samana Chagas. That's the translation which I saw. Samana means a monk, who was in Athens, and he created a, uh, a big scene, a furor, in the Forum when he self-immolated. It's only a sentence which I read, but my goodness, hey, that's what happened in India. And you know, just you know, killing himself, committing suicide, that was nothing, but to enter the fire element and burn himself, I mean, that would have been something which would have been recorded somewhere in the museum. So interesting, anyway. But that's is not not welcome for euthanasia? I'm not answering that question because some questions need to be considered by you. Anyway, affirm the power of meta. I use your stroking method on the door stop near the canteen. It wouldn't stay down, but after a stroke, it worked fine. <laughs> there's, there's, there's some strange things which you've seen in your life. <laughs> They're getting things to work. Getting cars to work as well. Car won't start. Give us some loving kindness. You wouldn't believe how many times it starts after that. It's wonderful that you and Vengel Chapel are here in England to help set up the Anacapa Bikuni project. Is it really true that Vengel Chapel is the only Bikuni in the UK? The only English Bikuni currently in the UK. There's English Bikunis over in now, uh, along the highway, California? There's a Welsh Bikuni. Welsh and there is an English Bikuni who used to be there. Okay. And yeah. that's it. Okay. Yeah. So, it's true. This is shocking. He can say a bit more about this. Thank you, Sarah. It's, they're not there. <laughs> There's lots of uh, women who are attempting uh, to uh, become Theravada bhikkhunis, but you know, the bhikkhuni ordination was not allowed for them, so they went overseas instead. But it's, I was personally responsible for some of that fuel nine years ago because I decided to give Bikuni ordination to four Bikunis who were over in Perth at the time. They asked, can we ordain? So well, why not? So they organised a Bikuni ordination for them to start it off. But they weren't allowed to do that here in the UK. So many of them just left. But the beginnings, fully ordained, all this nice. But, this is personal, I keep on repeating this, but it's one of the reasons why I get involved even now, was that somebody came up to me, I forget who they were, maybe a year or two years afterwards, and I think this was in the, um, the London Buddhist Society in Eccleston Square, and they said, 
England is dark for women who want to become fully ordained nuns. And they said something like that. And of course, that really hit me hard. Sometimes people say things very short, but with such pain, you think, I can't permit that to continue. One of the other things which somebody said to me, and this was even longer ago, this was in Perth, Australia. I'd given a talk, you know, on religious harmony and stuff. And this gentleman came up, he announced himself to me, he was maybe in his 60s. He said, I'm one of the leaders of the gay community here in Perth. Religion has been so cruel to our community. And then he walked away. And that word is so cruel. Oh. <laughs> Why? But instead of just saying, well, it's terrible, it's awful, and just walking away myself, I said, let's do something about this. So, whatever opportunity you have, you take that opportunity to, to address some of the people in our world who are really, really uh, giving a hard time for no reason whatsoever. No, no, no reasonable reason. That's the reason, isn't it? So anyway, so with the beginnings, that's why I don't have to do this. <laughs> Come to England and teach all the time. <laughs> I'm getting old, I should be retiring, but it's unfinished business. So I'll make it happen. But of course, I need your assistance. So uh, this is not just Ajahn Brahm retreat. Please check in with uh, Venerable Chandra. See how you can help. Because that'd be a really modest thing. We have one in Perth, it's brilliant. Why not here? Really, that's coming. Sometimes I find myself thinking unwholesome thoughts about people who are difficult, uh, wise, seemingly unkind, rude, seemingly unkind. How does one deal with this? People who are difficult, rude, unkind. There's a reason for them being unkind. They're in a bad mood today. There's something that's happened to them. A lot of times it's not to do with you. They just, as they say, woke up on the wrong side of the bed this morning. And everybody, they'll kick the cat, they won't feed the dog, they'll shout at people. And what really I thought was a very cool reflection was something the, the Dalai Lama once said, he said, you know, the, those people, difficult, rude, unkind, you may have to work with them, you know, when you go to your job, you meet them on the, the bus or the tube. You only have to meet them for a few hours every day, if that. And they have to live with themselves 24 hours a day for the rest of their life. Because if they're unkind to you, Imagine their relationship to themselves. You get such compassion for them. Poor thing, if you're that unkind to me, <sighs> must be a terrible to live with yourself. So you don't even think of yourself anymore because their pain and suffering is much more intense than any unkindness which they give to you. So, turn the unwholesome thoughts into compassionate thoughts. Fortunately, that life is like that. There's good people put in, put in intolerable situations. They're not bad people. They're just bad people put in just impossible positions. One of the jobs is to see if we can take away stress and expectations. So that people are put in possible situations. Sometimes it's a situation which makes the anger in the person. It's not them. Anyway, next one. In the mindfulness of the body section of the Mahasatipatthana Sutta's English translation, the following is there. Again, a monk when walking knows that he is walking, when standing knows that he is standing, when sitting knows that he is sitting, when lying down knows he's lying down. 
In whatever way his body is disposed, he knows that is how it is. But some teachers seem to be aware of the sensations when walking, sitting there, etc. Being aware of the sensations strikes me as something different to knowing that one is walking, as sitting, etc. In other words, I believe it is possible just to know in your mind that you are walking, sitting, etc. without focusing on the sensations to a mind you level as we instructed to do walking meditation. I wonder whether we are missing the point made by the Lord Buddha and overcomplicating the practice of mindfulness on the four postures. Bande's comments would be much appreciated. Sometimes uh, this is put under the, uh, the heading of Sampajanya, which is not just being mindful, but being aware of why you are walking, what's the purpose of it. So, in in the traditional Thai uh, Buddhism, especially in the forest tradition, you wouldn't just be mindful, just aware. You know the purpose of it. Why? And the example is, um, it's a bit cheeky, but it has a point to it. Once there was a very wealthy woman and she was going to the temple one evening to listen to a nice Dharma talk. And she known from you know, the police reports that there was a series of burglaries in that area, targeting rich people's houses. So because she was wealthy, she had a gatekeeper, a guard on the house. So before she left to go to the, the, uh, the, the Dharma talk, she told her gatekeeper, be mindful, there are thieves around. And the gatekeeper said, look, I, I practice meditation too, I practice Vipassana, I will be mindful, don't worry about that, go and enjoy my Dharma talk. So off she went to the Dharma talk, when she came back, the burglars had rampaged right throughout her house, taken everything. So she asked the guard to the house, Look, I thought I asked you to be mindful. I was mindful, madam. Well, how come we've been robbed? I was mindful. I saw the thieves going in and I noted, Thief going in, thief going in, thief going in. I saw them taking all your jewellery out. Jewellery going out, jewellery going out, jewellery going out. I saw them backing up their lorry. Backing up the lorry, backing up the lorry, back up the lorry. I saw them putting the safe on the back of that lorry. Safe going out, safe going out. I was very mindful of everything, madam. That is not enough, just being aware of walking, of sitting, of lying down. Why are you doing that? What's the purpose of it? It's the mindfulness of arm with wisdom. Otherwise, you'll end up just like that gatekeeper, <laughs> getting the sack of that smell. Please could you write down which rooms we can use for what? Thank you. <laughs> you can use the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> For letting go. <laughs> the restaurant, for breakfast, for lunch. <laughs> I think that's what I think. I think most There's of a sign on the rooms. There's it's a sign it, on it's the quite room. easy to find the rooms. Okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where it says private, you can use that for privacy. <laughs> <laughs> When you see staff only, that's when you can get a stick and staff to be able to walk <laughs> meditation without falling over. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Does one have to have that certain right or correct thing to previous lives in order to have any chance of achieving enlightenment in this world? And is a fan of mine here and interested in seeing the evidence that I did? Well, give yourself the benefit of the doubt. 
You are here, human being is supposed to be a very, very, very good birth, being a human being. Sometimes it must have been born in England. That may be something you did wrong in your previous life. <laughs> <laughs> But not that much. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being cheeky. But the point is, we don't know what we've done in our previous life unless you do get a deep meditation, get some past lives coming up. Don't give yourself benefit of the doubt, you don't know sort of how far you can go. So give it a try. With walking meditation, when I was very aware of my feet legs, I started to notice that the floor had disappeared. Ooh. And something, vision switched off. When noticing the floor reappearing, I would then notice my feet had vanished. Both floor and feet were absent when I was aware of the sound of the heating in the room. This pack continued. Any comments? Yeah, fine. Weird stuff. If it's weird stuff, unusual stuff, don't be scared, this is great. It gives you something to actually to contemplate, because otherwise you've got another how many more days to go, it can be really boring. <laughs> Just walking and sitting, sitting down, hearing a jump mom saying the same old jokes, I've heard those of you two before. Maybe it's suited, so it's all part of mindfulness. When something weird happens, that's great. <laughs> So, this, don't think about it, explore it. Why does this happen? What does it feel like? Are you afraid? What's going on? Where do this thoughts arise from? What causes it? It is discontent. They arise from within you, they don't come from outside. If they were coming outside, we could maybe put some barrier up, some <laughs> psychic defences, some a wall with not just bricks, but thick um, lead, with no electromagnetic radiation or um, what else? Um, any gamma rays can penetrate. They still come because they come from inside of you. You create them to, to, to give yourself something to think about. It's a distraction. But when you're very peaceful, content, happy, there's hardly any thoughts. The other time, I mentioned already when I just uh, had all these questions and thoughts with this great monk, Ajahn Tate. And just as soon as I go into his presence, everything vanished and so still. Not just a question, no questions in my mind, but no thoughts in my mind. Because I was so accepted. I didn't have to prove anything. When you really feel, sometimes you can call, talk about it as, as total acceptance, love, compassion. You don't need to think anymore. You don't need to, you don't have any business to do. And thought is a language of business. When you're just here, nothing to think about, you don't want to think. It's just too peaceful, too joyful. How many of you like great classical music? I remember just going to concerts. And I never realised at the time, one of the delightful features of great music <coughs> is that you're not allowed to speak. If I was listening to, you know, some, it's used to like Monty Verdi. And, and I don't know why, but I just really loved that before I became a monk. And then if you went to a concert and said, wow, that was really good, wasn't it? In the middle of the concert, you'd be thrown out disturbing the flow of the cause <coughs> and your appreciation of them. So I never realised at the time, the great music, you were right there with every moment. There was present moment awareness. There was no thinking. 
because your mind was totally satisfied with the beautiful orchestral and choral music. You don't have to think when you enjoy it, when you're satisfied and content. So of course, when you really, really get into the joyful meditations, oh, these thoughts can't come at all. They can't even break through. So the cause of them is discontent. Talking about real big contentment now. And also feeling of acceptance. You don't need to prove anything or do anything. Even people coming here, they're trying to achieve jhanas, trying to get enlightenment, trying to get wisdom, doing stuff. So, okay, you get enlightenment, then what? What happens next? Why is it always a next? Like I mentioned earlier, you pass one exam, you have another one coming next year, or next week sometimes. Why not fail now? Be a loser. So you've got nothing to attain for the rest of the victory. Not aiming for anything. Yeah, sometimes I do that as a bit of a trick. Usually on the last day. I look at somebody and say, look, none of you have got anywhere near Jarvis yet. You're the most hopeless crowd of meditators I've ever had the misfortune to teach. <laughs> <laughs> You're hopeless, you can't do it, so just relax. Then people get some good meditation. <laughs> They're not trying. They're not desperately struggling, struggling to prove something to themselves or to others. You know what I'm talking about, that tightness of tension. Uh, I've got to say something to my friend, I've just paid a lot of money, spent eight days, and I haven't got nothing to show for it. <laughs> Better get something quick. <laughs> that tightness of tension is the problem. Anyway, Dear Ajahn Brahm, some teachers say not to use the breath all the time as the object of the meditation as you will, will become attached to the breath. <laughs> I'm attached to the breath ever since I was born. <laughs> <laughs> if I let the breath go, I'm dead. <laughs> it would never be difficult to observe other types of meditation like watching body sensations. Would Ajahn advise to change the object for the meditation of the breath to wash your body sensation from time to time. Or is it better to stick, e.g., with the breath of one is used to doing the breath meditation practice dramas? Look, it's just the breath comes and goes by itself. Just when you're eating, you're not aware of the breath. When you're driving a car, you're not aware of breath going in, breath going out, crash. <laughs> If a nice answer to this is uh, something which I think I said on the first night, I certainly said in many other places, the end was three questions, meditation. Now is the most important time. The end was three questions was the person in front of you is the most important person in the world. For meditation, the object in front of you right now, whatever it is, Whatever it is, is the most important thing in the whole world. That's what you're aware of. Whatever's here right now. And the only thing to do, the most important thing to do, is to care. Care for this object. Don't try and cure it like that doctor said, money. Care for it. It has, whatever it is, with sloth and torpor, restlessness, some weird fantasy, it's here to teach you something. Give it respect. Has that ever happened to you? That people just don't respect you? You've got something to tell them and they just, just push you away? There was this doctor over in Sydney and you know, he made a lot of money, he bought himself a new sports car. And how can you enjoy a sports car 
in the city. This is too many uh, police, too much traffic. So he drove out into the, the, into the sticks, into the countryside, and he put his foot back. Whoa! And he enjoyed just the power and the speed. Whoa! And as he was just really <coughs> so selfishly making a lot of noise, speeding down these country lanes, he saw a farmer just you know, by the <coughs> side of the road shouting out, PIG! And he turned around and said, who are you calling a pig? And he crashed into a pig <laughs> and ruined his sports car and the pig as well. <laughs> Not very good. <laughs> the farmer was trying to warn him, pig! <laughs> so when we're not really mindful and we interpret things in the wrong way, we not only make a bad karma of killing an animal, but also we destroy our sports car. <laughs> so, the thing right in front of you is the most important thing in the world to watch. It's not always the best. And even in the meditation here, there comes a time the breath changes. And soon it gets into a delightful breath, which I'll describe tomorrow in the, in the Satipatthana. And from there into this beautiful nimitta, the breath is gone. It just transcends into something else. You don't get attached to the breath. The breath transforms you, but inside of it, to something more beautiful. So, body sensations? The body sensations are there, again, to be transcended. Another simile for you, this was actually from the uh, Samadhi Papa Sutra, when King Ajatasattva went to see the Buddha for the first time. And he went in his chariot, in his vehicle, as far as he could. And when he got to the gates of the, the monastery, he got out of the, the jet one, at least the bamboo grove monastery, he got out of his chariot and walked in his shoes. And through the monastery grounds to the hall. And then he got out of his shoes to enter the hall and see the Buddha standing against the pillar. Different things for different times. You can't drive the chariot into the dung hall. And you can't use the shoes, you know, through the muddy, stony path, you know, to the, the monastery. Just like I came from Australia in a, in a jet, an aircraft. But they wouldn't allow me to park the aircraft in the car park of Belso Bridge uh, Retreat Centre. I had to get out of the, out of the, uh, the aircraft and get into a car. From a car, it's actually a taxi, a train, <coughs> train first of all. And from the train into, because the train wouldn't stop at Belsey Bridge. There's no station here, let alone train tracks. And then from there a taxi, but the taxi would not come into the hall. I had to get out of the taxi, then walk in shoes, and then from shoes, barefoot into this hall. Different vehicles for different times. So even the breath, you can only use it for a certain time and then you get into something much more refined to take you deeper into meditation. That's how it works. I'll explain that tomorrow because it comes up in words. Thank you, you are simply the best loser. They say the biggest loser, isn't it? That's the word. But anyway, best loser, I'll take that. <laughs> I have a saying that being a monk, you should be humble. And if you are humble, what's the point of being humble if you can't thwart it? <laughs> All that hard work of 44 years being a monk, I'm so humble. I can't hide it, so people don't know about it. So if you are humble, thwart it. <laughs> I don't like messing around. Do you imagine about my being experimenting with uh, allowing, giving permission, my mind, to wander from my meditation object? 
This brought to mind your story of the mother of Anne and her child to leave home. My mind seems to naturally come home to the object with a greater sense of stability. Have I got the simile correct? Is this a good strategy? Yeah. Sometimes it's a wonderful strategy because you're developing kindness. Another simile for you to understand this. Okay. Uh, you've got a free afternoon, maybe a public holiday somewhere, and you know you, uh, somebody calls you on, on your cell phone. And it's a friend, not a close friend, but a friend. They say, Do you want to come out for a cup of coffee this afternoon? He said, Okay. And they said, great, because I want to take you to this coffee shop. I know you don't like this type of coffee, but I want you to try it. And I want you to actually uh, uh, come and discuss politics with me, because I know you're always talking about Buddhism and meditation, but this is really important, politics. You know, how this world is going to sort of develop. And I want you to sit in the back. I know you like sitting in the front of coffee shops. And you're not going to sort of have uh, a, a biscuit. We're going to have a, uh, a chocolate chip muffin. I know you think it's bad for your health, but I'm having a chocolate chip muffin. You're going to have a chocolate chip muffin. We're going to sit there for now because that's all the time I've got. If somebody invited you out for a cup of coffee, what they want, not really concerned what you wanted, to actually to uh, discuss what you want, what they want to talk about, not what you want. So, um, eat what they want, not what you want. Sit what you eat, they want, not what you want. Sit for the time they want to sit, not what you want to sit. What would you do? You try very quickly to make up an excuse. Oh, yeah, I've got to go and see the dentist this afternoon. I'm terribly sorry, maybe some other time. Because no one likes to be with a control freak, telling you what to do, how to do it. So as soon as you're off the, the phone, to keep your precepts and keep your, your um, sincerity, your virtue, you quickly bring up the dentist and make an appointment in the afternoon. <laughs> and as soon as you've made the appointment and get off the line, another phone call comes from a friend, another friend of yours. Say, hey, are you free this afternoon? Say, I just made an appointment for the dentist. I was a shame because I know you have this coffee shop. If, you're always telling me about some really good, healthy coffee. And you said the chocolate, no, the, the, the um, what is it, the free range biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, fair trade or something. They're just really, really delicious. <laughs> and you always tell me about this meditation and Buddhism and this. I've never actually had the chance to really discuss it with you. you know, can you can you talk about it? I know you like sitting out in front. I like being in the back, but I'll say what you want to say. And if they want to talk about what you want to talk about, eat and drink what you like, sit where you like, okay, I'll be there. And you get on the phone, I'm sorry dentist, but I've got another appointment. And then you go and sit with them. And it's supposed to only have an hour. You spend three or four hours sitting there with someone who is kind and interested. Now the meaning of that simile is sometimes you tell your mind, okay, we're going to go and to the hall. I know you like sitting elsewhere in these other rooms. You're going to sit in the hall. You are going to watch the breath. I know you like watching other objects, but today you're going to watch what I want you to watch, the, the breath. And you're going to do it for one hour, not two hours or half an hour. You're going to sit there for one hour because that's what I want you to do. You're not going to sit in the back, you're going to sit in the front. That's where I like sitting. And sometimes that's what you do to your mind. Okay, right, this is it. We're going to do an hour's meditation, okay? An hour, mind. You hear that? An hour. You're not going to wander off anywhere. I know you're not wandering off here, wandering off there, contemplating all sorts of stuff. You are going to watch the breath. The breath. You got it? What does your mind do? It makes another appointment somewhere. <laughs> anywhere to get away from you. I think you get the message.
<laughs> your mind wanders off to get away from you, to escape from you. You're a control freak. Telling your brain and your mind what to do and how to do it. That is not the way to meditate. That is why the mind wanders. But my mind used to wander off. Instead of suppressing it, using force, why? Why can't we just sit together and watch the breath? Blind. And the sin exploited is because my mind was afraid of me. It had traumatized by me. Sometimes I would sit there and have them charge my mind. You've really got to watch them right, okay? Watch it. Ah. <laughs> and traumatized by the force which I used on my mind. So my mind never trusted me. So when you that question, you're beginning to establish trust with your mind and you. In other words, you can hang out together. Why just wander off when you're with a good friend? So you think about it. You always seem so comfortable in yourself. Do you ever get anxious or scared? <laughs> Oh, I knew you were going to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> Anxious or scared? <laughs> there was one time when uh, there was a, so there were five, six years of a, a monk in Thailand, and there was a series of uh, uh, buses exploded in flames. They were very, very poorly maintained. And even a fellow monk of mine, you know, he was in a bus and it's caught on fire. He had to rush out and uh, he lost his bowl and roll. And actually the bus company just sent him a replacement bowl and roll. It was you know, occurring again and again and again. And I was in the bus, just uh, sitting. They always put the monks up the front. And then I was in the window, oh, no, not the window seat, the aisle seat. And another man was next to me in the window seat. And then I hadn't read those reports in the newspapers. So when a gentleman sort of <coughs> from the back shouted out, Fire! Fire! The bus driver slammed on the brakes. The bus driver went through, you know, he just climbed out the window, as did the monk sitting next to me. <laughs> he climbed out the window too. And there were so many people just crowding the aisle trying to get out. And, you know, as one of the very strict rules we keep as a monk in time is not to come into physical contact with, with a woman. And so there's lots of girls there, so I was just waiting for them all to go out before I could go out. I never realised it was an emergency, and any moment that sort of um, bus would explode into flame. So I was just sitting there, peaceful. And you know, all the others had gone out, I was about to get out of my seat and get out myself. And there was one gentleman in the back who was actually investigating. So it's only a cigarette. We put it out, it's not a real fire. The man sitting next to me was very embarrassed <laughs> because he just ran out the window. <laughs> and because I was in the window, not on the aisle seat at the front, everybody coming back into the bus, they had to pass me. <laughs> <laughs> some, some, <laughs> it wasn't that I was an hour and a half, it was I was stupid, I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> but I took it anyway. <laughs> so, why are you being scared or anxious? As far as the people is concerned, the anxious, why are you anxious? Whatever happens, happens. I had this, you know, sometimes when I first really became popular as a speaker, it was weird. Because one time I got invited to give this, my first really big talk, I think it was about 4,000, 5,000 people in Singapore, in a convention centre, just me, no one else. And as I went into the hall, saw so all this people, it was like a rock concert. And I saw the chair where I was going to sort of deliver the talk. 
I thought, what the hell's going on? How did I get myself into this? <laughs> That's my feeling. And I thought, this is dangerous stuff. Really, really scary territory in the sense that, see, many, many people, when they get such fame, fortune, adulation, they lose it. Then I thought, hang on, no, it's not me. It's all the teachings which I got. There was no from Ajahn Chah, the other teachers I knew. I was just being a vehicle for them. You have the idea of oneself. And as soon as I got that perception, it's nothing to do with me. I don't know my teachings. Therefore, I'm not afraid of them. So I can sit there and have fun with no anxiety. Not worrying if people thought it was good. They thought it was good. What a wonderful thing to be able to share the Dharma. And if I really stuffed up and made a mess of it, that was an even better outcome. And I could go back to Australia and stay in my cave and have a nice peaceful life. <laughs> <laughs> Either way I would. That type of positive attitude would mean that I didn't invest any, any sort of um, energy or hopes or fears in being a success. Either way, didn't matter. That means you don't have any fear. How can I stop being scared of growth? Go and find one. <laughs> if you find one, just if you can find it, actually there is this time of year in England and many other countries too, there is a ghost, there's you know, a lot of ghosts that always come out this time of year. And it's one of the most dangerous ghosts in the world. And I, I personally seen it possess people. Okay, I'm on my mind because it's going to bring people to you. And I've seen it even kill people. <laughs> And it, it's, we call it, in Thailand, it's called Pinai Kua, which translates as the ghost in the bottle. It's called whiskey, beer. You drink a few, you sit to that, and it possesses you. And you know they're possessed because they don't talk in a normal voice. You <laughs> are, <laughs> They can't walk in a straight line, they're possessed. But sometimes <laughs> they drive, drive a car and kill themselves. No, that's why whiskey and gin and vodka, that's why it's called spirits. <laughs> <laughs> the ghost in the bottle. Those ghosts I have seen. <laughs> and those are dangerous spirits. Other kind of stuff, they're just little cute, poor people just being stuck somewhere. So why are you scared of them? I think it's probably too many movies, too many books. People love to scare themselves. And then, you know, when that scariness sticks, sort of, they, don't, they get stuck like that. When I told a story of ghosts in the last retreat I gave in China Grove, was the most uh, I like him person is this guy who is strong. He went back to his room. He lay down. He had the shutter on the window shut. And then as soon as he lay down, he heard something walking towards his window. He was fully awake, but imagine it, heard him walking, stopped at his window. And he was too mine, so I just hide under the blankets. Or should I open the window? He decided to open the window. And he looked out and he saw it. And the thing saw him. It was a kangaroo. <laughs> <laughs> and the kangaroo looked at him. <laughs> and the kangaroo ran right away. The kangaroo was the one which was scared. <laughs> and this actually happens so often in Australia because the kangaroos at night time, they don't hop. They just uh, put their feet out and they, they just move forward, they drag their, their back feet forward. And so many people, it sounds like somebody walking. So, most, cat, most ghosts just, uh, just do not exist. The other ones which do exist are just a fun. <laughs>
<laughs> the hot piece kind of goes, which I first of all, go and get real ghost stories, not the fake ones. Beautiful ones. Okay, they're nice. The nice, beautiful ghost stories. Yeah, might as well. <laughs> Can animals be reborn as ghosts? Of course they can. There's a woman, I think her husband died a long time ago, and she's had one dog in her house. You know how attached she gets to her pets? And one day she was going for a walk in the forest with the dog playing with it, jumping up and down, enjoying the company. And when she got back, she realised that she'd lost her finger ring. And it wasn't expensive, but it was like emotionally had a lot of attachments to that finger ring. So the two of them went back into the forest and tried looking roughly where they thought they must have lost it. You know, trying to look for a ring in a forest. Impossible. But they tried anyway. The next couple of days, you know, she, she comes to our centre now now, in Perth, and the next couple of days the dog got ill and died. So she forgot all about her figuring, and with the grief of losing someone so close to her, her dog. But after you know, burying the dog, she swore to me, she said, look, I heard that dog barking in my house. I'm not imagining it, it's my dog, I know the sound of my dog's voice. But she was never in the same room when her dog barked. So she'd always run to that room, open the door, no dog there. And that happened for about two or three days. And then once she was at the front door of her house, and she heard the dog barking just on the other side of the door. Now only a couple of inches away, but the door was between them. So she really thought, now I can see that, my dog again. She opened the door quickly, there's no dog there. But in the middle of the welcome mat was her finger ring. Her dog had found her finger ring for her, and that's the last time she heard of her dog. Beautiful little story. Ghosts are really beautiful, good, wonderful people, beings. Just another wonderful little story, there was these two people in one of the old people's homes over in Perth. And there's this old man who lost his wife a long time ago. This uh, lady who lost her husband. So they just, you know, bonded together. And not never could get married, but, you know, just be friends together. You know, she would cook meals for him and he would you know, just do little other chores for her you know, in their rooms in the, the old folks' home. And they became very close friends. They had no talk, and you know, he, he did tell her that he had a sister back in England somewhere, that's the only family he had. So when he suddenly died, the people in the old folks' home you know, just wanted to find out, you know, family, they had no record of any sister in England. And she said, oh, he told me he had one here, but they couldn't find any records. So she felt a bit guilty. She never asked the name of um, the sister or how to contact her. And so one night she fell asleep. In the middle of the night, she felt she woke up, someone was stroking her cheek. And she woke up terrified, thinking someone had got into her room and was going to rape her or something. So it turned on the light, there was no one in the room. The door was locked, the window was shut, and she had a piece of tissue, for use at night time, folded on the bedside table. She watched it rise up into the air and fall on the ground. There was no draught, no source of wind. 
She picked up that piece of paper and it had some numbers on it. It was the telephone number of the sister of this fellow who had died. He'd written down for her. So, no, this is after he died. So that she could tell. There's another fellow, uh, Peter Say, I don't mind saying it because he's in Tasmania now. His family were from Essex, migrated over to Perth, and most of the family were over here. And he said he woke up in the middle of the night <coughs> and he lived at home, uh, just, uh, just by himself in his house, not far from our centre. And he turned on the light and there was his mother standing at the end of the bed. But this is Peter Sale. He is just the last person to ever expect, you know, to sort of, you know, be uh, into weird stuff. He was really a down-to-earth person. And so he saw Hope's mum, who's supposed to be in Essex. He realised it was not a ghost. So he realised it was a ghost because his mum wasn't anywhere near Australia. <coughs> but he was in his bed, looking at his mum, standing up, smiling at him. So the most beautiful feeling he had, not fear, but seeing his mother for one last time, expressing her love for her son, smiling, and he felt so much joy and happiness even though he knew his mother must have died. And it wasn't a flash, it was about three or four minutes, he said. His mother standing there, clear, not some shadow trying to interpret, just as if, you know, that she was really there, just like I'm watching you, or you're watching me. Clear, smiling, no, no words were necessary, no thoughts, just bathing in his mother's love. And after three or four minutes, she just faded away, disappeared. And he wasn't crying. He felt what an amazing experience that was, and how lucky he was to have seen his mother for one last time. Being English, he turned on the electric kettle and made himself a cup of tea. <laughs> That's what the English do in such situations. And he was drinking his tea from the telephone man. It's in the middle of the night, sister in England, Pete, across the bad years with me on Mum's side. How the heck do you know that? We just come back from the hospital, just now. How do you know? And he told the story his mother had been to visit him. So beautiful can that be? So, ghost stories are just gorgeous, real ones. They're not scary at all. They just complete some unfinished business. Show when somebody's died, they still love you and care for you. And they still want to just make sure you're okay. One of my Sri Lankan disciples, her sister, getting really, really sick with a cancer. And I don't know why she did this, but she took her to Singapore to try and you know, really get the best doctors, try and make, there's plenty of good doctors in, in Sri Lanka, trying to make sure that she was going to be okay, give her the very best. But unfortunately, that they couldn't do anything, so uh, her sister, who was a follower of mine, gave me a call and said, can you please speak to my sister, she's dying. So I just, and she said, look, she's not going to be able to say very much because, you know, she's paralysed from the neck down and she's dying. So I, for three nights in a row, I talked to her sister from the phone in Australia to Singapore, trying to give her some, some help in the dying process. And the fourth night, never got any call, realised that she must have died. The fifth night, her sister called and said, my sister died, you know, just the night before. I said, yeah, I, I thought that, that's why I didn't call. But I have to tell you this, that 
six or seven hours after she died, she sent us an email from her account saying that she was okay and especially please thank Ajahn Brahm for his advice. So that's why I had to give you a call now and tell you. She had been paralysed for many days before. There's no way she could send any emails. <coughs> After death, six hours, she sent that email. Being a man not really conversant with technology, I always wondered what Gmail meant. <laughs> <laughs> Ghost mail. <laughs> Okay, got a couple of stories there. You say to reduce will to get rid of it. The problem I have that some people have lived their life with little will as they have been oppressed. Now that's no, just uh, not what we mean. It's actually just the learning of meditation to relax. So you have an opportunity to let go of your will. It doesn't, you, you can't will yourself to let go of the will, that's a small will, that's not how you can get to it. You get so still, so peaceful. The will, the choice is not interrupting you. And then after a while, you get really deeply into this. And so, in the jhanas, especially the second jhana, there's no will around at all. There's no button to press, to move. You can't come out of that state to will. It's just where the energy of that state just wears out, then you emerge afterwards. You're sort of stuck in there, but very pleasantly, blissed out. Wonderful state. But that's one of the signs of the second jhana. It's still, perfectly still, because there's nothing to move it. This thing called will has gone. And the thing is, it's not your will. We always interpret the will as being one of our essential possessions. This is why it freaks you out afterwards. You know, at some point you've already been saying that things have gone missing or you just, uh, when, when you're walking meditation, the floor disappears. Freaky stuff is quite safe. And sometimes I mention you're walking meditation, I'm not doing the walking. It is automatic. Things which you always believe you cause, you will, you make happen, they happen by themselves. You don't need to do anything. Those weird experiences challenge the way you perceive the world. But more about that another time. If all physical illnesses can be cured by meditation, how is it that the Buddha had dysentery? Ajahn Chah had a stroke, then the case of them and had cancer. It's not all physical illnesses can be cured by meditation. So there's you know, some physical illness. Meditation can alleviate some symptoms. And every now and again it can actually do some amazing cures, but not everyone can be cured. Because everyone has to die sooner or later. So the meditation, just letting go, can create a huge amount of physical health and well-being. Not demanding things from others, but medication. <coughs> so it's not the case of all, but some can. We all know that stress-related illnesses are just huge. And at the very least we know how stress can, um, can cause many, many illnesses. It was the comedian George Burns, I think on his 96th birthday, you know, he used to go out in the evening to nightclubs. He's 96. Drinking whiskey, smoking big cigars, 
than eating hamburgers. And he was interviewed and said, but you eat greasy food, smoke cigarettes or rather big cigars, drink whiskey, stay out at all hours of the night. At your age, aren't you concerned about your lifestyle? Aren't you worried about your health? And he replied, my wife was worried about my health. That's why she died 20 years ago. <laughs> the worry or is it the stuff you put in your mouth or the stuff you put in your mind? Do Buddhas class humans as high beings and other beings live so why? No, it is they class <coughs> Buddhists or human beings as you know a place where you have suffering and happiness. You know suffering to keep you on your toes, realizing this you can't really be that lax because you don't know what's going to happen next. But in our happiness and comfort, then you have some time and freedom to actually contemplate and meditate and ask the questions of why. So it's they call it a very fortunate life that you are a human being. But you do the rounds. Humans, animals, ghosts, devas, all sorts of different beings. So, it depends. Where are you going to go next? Isn't that what, um, not Google, where do you want to go today? What's that? Google Maps. Google well, Maps. No, Google Maps or something else. Anyway, so where do you want to go next in life? Where do you want to explore next? in your journey through samsara. Do you want to be a ghost? A person is scared of ghosts. Do you want to have your next life as a ghost? <laughs> really interesting. Then you can come and scare me. Get out of here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So, I think mean, that's enough question now. It's 9.30. Okay, there's still a few to ask, so <laughs> more than a few. I think I've got to about half of them. And what's done is finished. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have to finish it, you know. Okay. Stop!